Guerrilla Apache Tribe of American Indians presents Pop Screen, a podcast from The Geek Show, part of The Geek Show Podcast Network. We are that corner of The Geek Show that likes to deal with the good, the bad and the perplexing of movies, either starring about or by pop stars. No other podcast covers a broad range of musical and cinematic genres, from documentaries to science fiction, from country and western to hip-hop. I'm your host, Graham Williamson. I'm a filmmaker and an author for Byline Times and The Geek Show. I also sometimes write inlay booklets for Second Run, DVD, and I've been joined this week by... Hello, I'm in Neff. Do you not get it? That is, is it? Yes, yes, <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, in Neff, yeah, I am a po- occasional podcaster for The Geek Show. Uh, I've been with these guys for a very, very, very long time. Um, yeah, I'm a film industry worker, hi, yeah. Yeah, essentially, yes. Uh, and today we are doing a gunfight. Uh, and normally I like to start these off by asking what your history is with the musical artists that we're covering. Although I feel like this is the one where that would be least relevant because it's my theory that everyone is at least a bit of a Johnny Cash fan. And you better be, because if you don't... Um... <laughs> Yeah, if you're not listeners, please do write in uh, to someone who cares. <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, completely agree with uh, Graham's comment there because, uh, well, I, I can't even remember like when I first discovered his music because it was around about when I was in my teenage years and I caught, I think it was his performance on Jules Holland mm. when. Um, uh, he was in promotion for American Recordings, the first American Recordings album he did with Rick Rubin. Yeah. Um, and of course, he was playing for some prison blues. And there was there was just something so cool about him, man. Mm. And, and I think, yeah, <laughs> how can you not love him? That, 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 that's my question. Well, it's absolutely true, uh, particularly when, as you say, he did that American Recordings series towards the end of his life that... It introduced him to a new generation, but in a way that was perfectly consistent with mm. what had come before. If it, if it hadn't worked, imagine what a dreadful bandwagon hopping thing it could have been for a singer in his 80s to be recording songs by Nine Inch Nails if it had been done in any way other than the way he approached those songs. But yeah. Of course, as it was, it was the ideal last act for that particular career. Mm. No, I completely agree. And Cash always had a like a standpoint of re-invent- reinventing his career time and time again. Uh, I mean, when you look at his early stuff with like Sun Records, where mm. of course the original you know boom chicka boom chicka boom sound comes from, mm-hmm. which was yes. you know, very distinct to his sound, then he would like translate it into his the the live albums that he did with the the prison systems. Mm. So like at Folsom Prison and San Quentin. And then again, obviously, his career took a little bit of a downpour, you know, because of his uh, drug drug habits and his drug addiction at the time. This was around about, what, late 70s to the 80s? Yeah, that's about course... right. I don't know when exactly uh, drugs were an issue for him, but it, I do know that the 70s and 80s were not a great time for cash. Hmm. Uh, and it was quite unfortunate because um, I think around about this time he was only really doing like charity events and things like that as terms in terms of his um, like live output. So it was a bit of a shame. And plus Columbia, I don't think were giving him much spotlight at the time. Um, mm. So it wasn't until like obviously Rick Rubin entered the frame with the American Recordings series that he just uh, revitalized his career a lot more. And I think Rick Rubin's a genius in that light. For at least mm, doing absolutely. that. Absolutely. Because it, it's easy to forget that the, the American recording CV started out in the mid 90s. And at that point, there still isn't really a playbook for what happens when mm. a rock star or a pop star, or in this case, a country and Western star, gets old. You know, the it, it, it is still. Mm. A, it is still kind of a young man's game. You know, the only way that you can get old is by not caring that you've become a joke. The idea that you could have someone like Johnny Cash making recordings that have this immense dignity and power to them that comes from his age was Mm. 
not really anywhere else in pop culture at that time. Yes, definitely. And he, he always had that quality all the way out through his career, you know. He always was, like, down-to-earthed, honest. Mm. Um, obviously, writing a lot about, obviously, being on the breadline in American society. Also, like, taking perspectives of various literary characters, obviously, talking about, you know, uh, criminal system, the American justice system, things like that, but also having then implementing them with, you know, like a really great sense of humor too. Mm. Um, well, I yeah, I first found out about Johnny Cash from my dad, and my dad's main connection with Johnny Cash was that he thought A Boy Called Sue was an incredibly funny song, which it is. <laughs> it is. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it, it's strange in retrospect that people didn't see that the guy who wrote songs like False and Prison Blues would gain gravitas and power as he got older. But like I say, there was just no sort of cultural model for a singer to grow old like that uh, at that time. You know, the only people who'd had successful careers in their old age were people who were pre-rock and roll like Sinatra or someone mm. like that. So... This is, that was a very new thing, but A Gunfight was made in 1971, which was kind of an interesting year for him. It was the year when he released uh, Man in Black, which is one of his most political, socially conscious albums. It's the one with, uh, was it Vietnam Talking Blues on? Uh, let me just quickly double check that, because I know, because like a lot of uh, recording artists of his day, I mean, they, the output was it's like staggering. Yeah. S- singing in Vietnam, talking blues, which firstly, make your mind up if you're singing or talking, Johnny. But uh, yeah, that was the title of the song. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it here. Yeah. Um yeah, um, I, I don't think I've listened to that one, actually, uh, interesting enough, because like I said, it, his output was so staggering at that mm. time, because you're talking about like 60 plus albums or so, and obviously some of them are re-releases, because that's how they are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just it's just the way of the gamut, really, with artists of like that. Yeah, certainly the further back we go with pop screen, the more likely you are to get artists where the the canon is hard to draw a circle around because they just bang stuff out. I mean, I remember when we did Get On Up, uh, the James Brown biopic, Mm. we were kind of wondering what the classic James Brown album was. And the answer is probably live albums because most of the studio albums were just sort of rushed out because he needed at least two albums out that year because that's what singers back then did and the live albums are the ones where he sort of paused and took stock and gave you a taste of like some of the best things he'd been working on over that period and you can say the same for Johnny Cash's early period there's a lot of good albums there but the classic ones the ones everyone has to listen to are as you said, the, the the albums that he recorded live in San Quentin and in Folsom Prison. Mm, definitely. I mean, that's how I... I think that was my first introduction to... Well, first album output that I heard from Johnny Cash. It was at Folsom mm. Prison. So it totally makes sense to go back to those two records because they just give you a clear indication of what he was like as a performer, as an artist. And just the idea of like performing in front of a prison. No one else, you know, mm. in the history of... Uh, American music at that time. Um, I think the only other person who w- was thinking about that was BB King. He did a live record at uh, Prison oh, System. I, th- I think it was at, like at Cook County Jail or something like that. Yeah, right. it was around about the same time period. But j- it was really Johnny who kind of spearheaded that, and you know, people were dismissive of him for that, saying that, especially Columbia, just saying to him like. Is this really such a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want your music to be primarily associated with people serving a life sentence for murder? And part of you thinks, like, he's a country singer. Of course he does. That's exactly what you want. And it works. It totally yeah. works. Um... But this is, this is a, a very different way in which murder raises its head in Johnny Cash's canon. Because uh, when I watch this film... My initial thought was, I had no idea this existed before. Mm. And then it struck me that I, and probably everyone with at least a passing 
familiarity with Johnny Cash has seen about three seconds of this film, haven't they? I know, I guess, I don't know exactly which three seconds you're on about. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, it's yeah. Mark Romanek's video to Hurt, which is an astonishing piece of work, includes that clip of him. That clip of him in the, the Hurt video where he turns to the camera and stay, says, you've stayed the hell away from me, yeah, you have. Mm. That's from this movie. Yes. Um, and I had no idea that clip was in this movie initially going into mm-hmm. it like you, because um, <clears throat> obviously I'd seen the clip before on the Hurt music video, and I'm sure we'll get onto that uh, iconic video as we will later on down the line, but obviously yeah. first more about the film. Um, but yeah, this is kind of an, an obscure Western that came in the 70s, because it's not just Johnny Cash who's starring in this, because mm. this also has... Uh, well, maybe not a prime dear, Kirk Douglas as well. Kirk Douglas, yeah. And you, you would think, how could a movie with two such extraordinarily famous people fall into obscurity? And I was one of the things I was trying to do to get a picture of this movie was I was looking at what other westerns were released that year because the the western, particularly as you get towards the end of the the golden age of hollywood westerns Mm -hmm. becomes a really volatile and weird genre uh yeah yeah so some some other westerns that were out in 71 just to give you a sense of where the genre was at this time uh mccabe and mrs miller oh dear right okay (laughs) um which is a great Mm. movie but bleak as hell yes uh honey calder with raquel welsh lawman directed by Michael Winner, uh, which I only bring up because uh, Burt Lancaster dangled him over the edge of a cliff while they were filming. And I think uh, we, we all... That, 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 you know, I, don't, yeah, I, I do not feel shocked about that. Burt Lancaster dangling Michael Winner <laughs> off a cliff. <laughs> that sounds like something he would totally do. Uh, there's another film that we could do for pop screen. There's Blind Man, which is one of the surprisingly... Uh, part of the surprisingly voluminous screen career of Ringo Starr. If only to add to the Ringo uh, Starr back catalogue for pop screen. The the Ringo Starr cinematic universe, yes. Yes. um... Uh, You've also got the spaghetti western A Town Called Bastard, which, as uh, our regular co-host Mark Cunliffe said, has a title that's probably meant to sound sort of tough and westerny, but in fact it only works if you say it in the voice of Alexi Sale. <laughs> a town called Bastard. A town called Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, a, a, a sort of you can you can see that the genre is splintering here. You have some really grim revisionist westerns like McCabe and Mrs. Miller. You have some very wild spaghetti things like a town called, ba- a town called Bastard and Blind Man. Uh, and then you have the odd thing like Law Man and Hanny Calder, which is just sort of trucking along and doing the same old trad western stuff, but with newer stars. And I would say a gunfight probably hews a bit closer to the last type but i also think it probably wants to be the first type yeah i mean i guess i mean if anything i think a gunfight reminds me more of the television westerns of american Mm. like the like tv of that time because it has that very televisual look i'm not saying that to obviously diminish it because you know the sets are great and Mm. Um, done with movie the... production value certainly yeah, yeah yeah definitely but i think it's very telling because the copy that i watched because this film is freely available on youtube which i assume is where you saw it as well Green. it is yeah yeah um not the best quality bit ruddy no. um and that definitely comes across unfortunately um yeah but it reminds me of like say stuff like gunsmoke or yeah. um like I, I can't even remember any like television westerns that you know the, the, the kind of stuff that you know like quentin tarantino would poke fun at mm-hmm. in, like quint in uh once upon a time in hollywood you know it, it's appropriate that you say that because lamont johnson the actor started the lamont johnson the director so he started off as an actor but uh, his first directorial credits were on uh have gun will travel which is yes very much one of those tv series quentin tarantino was thinking about when he did once upon a time in hollywood mm. Yes. So, so you know, it's it's not 
surprising to learn that because you know you've got a director who's kind of bleeding out into all these different genres did a few bits mm. of uh, i've just looked this up now did a bit of uh, alfred hitchcock's presents as well as an actor. yeah it's it's not a great film career but the tv career is, is pretty impressive i think hmm. yeah so it's, it's definitely a very strong cv looking at that looking at it that way yeah I, I suppose what's interesting about it is that as you say, in many ways, it is a very televisual, a very traditional Western, but the storyline of it is starting to shade into that environment that that Robert Altman was getting into with things like McCabe and Mrs. Miller and Buffalo Bill and the Indians, where it's mm. about those Westerns that analyze how the genre became myth, those Westerns that analyze how the, how the Wild West became show business in a way. Mm. Yeah, because it, it is very much has that angle to it, doesn't it? Because it's mm. not, um, because I mean, the synopsis for a gunfight is like the kind of the easiest synopsis in the world to, <laughs> yes. um, to, to, to talk about. Yeah, the, the synopsis for a gunfight is like two aging gunfighters wanting a gunfight. That's it. But not just a gunfight, is it? It's a gunfight for a paying audience, which is the thing that I think is, apart from the fact that it stars Johnny Cash, which is you know very odd he he didn't act much he's perfectly good in this i think although you can mm, i agree you can make the argument that it's a role basically tailored for him you know he'd been playing mm. a cowboy for most of his life but uh but yeah he, he's perfectly good in this but the, the odd thing in it really is that it has this very traditional sheen to it but the story feels like it wants to go in this more misdebunking direction and you get that from the ending don't you yeah it, yeah it, yeah i really really wanted like kind of a psychological breakdown in a, an odd way and it kind of doesn't really simmer up to it does it? it it happens very suddenly that suddenly i mean Lamont Johnson loves doing big zooms in on Johnny Cash's face, which is fair enough. You know, it's the 70s. It's the golden age of big long zooms. You know, have your fill. Um, but yeah, at the ending, it suddenly goes into this more kind of, I, I want to say melodramatic, but that's not fair. The drama no, is yeah. carried very much by the camera movements and the music and the use of this almost sort of Roigian use of flashback, which is very impressive, but almost completely at odds with everything that's happened in the one and a half hours before. I agree. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of a weird footnote. And to, to top things all off, it, it felt like all of a sudden, like, um, it turned into Rashomon. It was just like, <laughs> I got really confused. It was just like, wait, is this another perspective? And then I finally got the gist of it. Oh, no, wait, no, he's imagining if he lost the gunfight. Right, okay, now I get you. Yes, w Wikipedia's plot synopsis ends brilliantly with, uh, uh, there is an extended fantasy sequence near the end where we see what might have happened if Tenere had won which may have confused some viewers. It's not often that you see like an encyclopedia just sort of <laughs> gently acknowledging that something might have gone a bit wrong here. Yeah, mm, it, it could have done like with another redraft, I think, that bit. So <laughs> um, I, th I think that's its problem. But no, I totally agree. Because the preceding uh, hour, hour, what, hour and 25 minutes or so, I, I really yeah, liked. Yeah. Um, mm. And it's it, it, it's kind of strange because I'm currently going through like the Sage Westerns because I never really was like into like the Hollywood Westerns back mm. and when, if you asked me this like a few years ago because I always felt that it was kind of a production line. Yeah. But recently that's kind of changed with sort of, I guess, the B-movie Western-ish. Yeah. And I'm not really saying that a gunfight is akin to a B-movie Western because it, it really is. It's still got it's... Kirk Douglas in it. You know, it can only yeah. be so B-movie when it's got Kirk Douglas there, yes. Mm. And I think that can also diminish, like, certain films. Mm. But at the same time, you know, it, it's got, like, this very, you know, strong canonical Western identity that, you know... And it just kind of looks a bit badass. I mean, just to see... Mm. I mean, in the opening scene, Johnny Cash... Um, a snake bites his horse. The horse collapses. Yes. Obviously, shoots the rattlesnake and uh, half, and obviously gets his horse uh, to the nearest medic on like nearby town. So you you just wonder um, how it, it it just really like rolls off the tongue. 
Completely at that, that stage, guy. it's Johnny Cash with a beard, which I think is the most uncanny thing in the film. There's something almost primally wrong about that, in my opinion. I get, I do kind of get that, yeah, because the the image of Johnny Cash you immediately get is obviously this very clean shave and obviously the black suit and the rolled yeah. back hair. Yeah. But he get he gets into town and he has a shave, which is one of those classic Western plot beats, isn't it? You have to establish that your main character's been travelling for ages, so he needs a beard. Uh, but also, the Western is a mostly pre-hippie genre, so you need to get rid of that face fuzz, you no good beatnik. Uh, it, it's really yeah. a whole genre about male grooming when you think about it. But um... It is a little bit, yeah. Now that you put it that way. Um... Hmm. But yes, um, and, and like I say, he, he's good in this, isn't he, Cash? He's, you can't really, normally if you watch a pop star performance that doesn't work, and particularly when it's the early 70s, where there are some hmm. fabulous actors running around, you know, you expect to watch this and think, oh my God, you could have got Gene Hackman in to do this or something. But no, he's fine. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about his performance. Yeah, you can, I completely agree. He works. He, he... It was like, as you were saying before, he's completely tailored into, like, a uh, cowboy. And it's not yeah. hard to think that, because, you know, Johnny Cash sung about cowboys for years and years and years. Did, obviously, countless, like, album covers where he's, like, dressed in, like, say, like, Indian attire or sometimes like as a cowboy. So mm. it, it's not hard to believe that at all. And I completely agree. He works, especially when he's, like, obviously chattering away to Kirk Douglas, because they do kind of feel like together the two old friends having a drink, sometimes having yes. a chat about old life. And then obviously, you know, um, Cash needs some money, as Abe's cross-character mm. says. And that's where the real... Um, the the, the, the mechanic starts to switch a little bit. Because weirdly enough, I kind of felt like it was a weird little bit of a hangout movie at the same time. Yes, I'm glad you said that, because I, I rem distinctly remember thinking when uh, I was watching it, this is the only Western I've ever seen where the final gunfight is set up in a relaxed conversation with like two friends over some beer it's like richard linklater's high noon at that point <laughs> yeah 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 i completely agree on that uh but it, it does get quite fractious there is a fist fight between cash and douglas afterwards which is like it comes after you've had this friendship established and even though you understand why it's there narratively, you understand that they're setting up this rivalry that's going to end, it, it's always going to end in one man's death, but I just wanted them to kiss after it. <laughs> You do, you do, you do wonder that if when uh, Abe Cross does start bur uh, burying his horse, spoilers, the horse dies. So, mm. yes, um, yeah. So you you do end up wondering that by the end. <laughs> but no, it, it's it's really likable chemistry. It's it's really quite sweet in a lot of areas, but equally as bitter. Um, I think. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> Uh, there's two fabulous women in this, which I, I guess is to try and avoid people wanting the two male leads to make out. But uh, <laughs> Kirk Douglas's wife is played by Jane Alexander, who is a, an actress who's probably more successful in her later career than she mm. is. Uh, than, than, I mean, she had her successes early on, but I always think of her as uh, the woman from Todd Salons' film Happiness, and she does have a lot of sort of very good late career roles like that in the way that mm. a lot of Hollywood actresses sadly don't. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've just looked her up now because she also, uh, after a gunfight, she was in All the President's Men, Kramer versus Kramer. Um, so, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's definitely plenty there. And uh, Johnny Cash's girlfriend is played by Karen Black. Oh, I know your love for Karen Black. Well, she's just great, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. Because um, I don't, I can't, I, I do remember in Nashville, she she is in that, isn't she? Yeah, um, yeah. And um, and that's kind of the only thing that I know Karen Black for. So unfortunately, I can't really add much to the conversation on this. Uh, well, she's she's one of those actors who had a great seventies. I mean, she she 
did a lot after that. Uh, one of my favourite roles of hers in, again, Robert Altman's uh, Come Back to the Five and Night, Dime Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean came mm. in the early 80s. But she's, she's just one of those performances who is iconically 70s. Like when you think of the 70s New Hollywood, you might think about Easy Rider or, as you say, Nashville or Day of the Locust. Uh, and it just so happens that Cameron Black's in all of those and Trilogy of Terror and Alfred Hitchcock's last film and, weirdly, Airport 1975. Of all that I would say is she only took because she realised she was going to define the 70s and if you're going to define the 70s you need to have at least one cruddy disaster movie in your resume <laughs> and 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 don't forget toby hooper's invaders from mars of course yes i think mean, late on in her career she did become a sort of horror icon i think largely because in the middle of that great 70s run she did a tv movie called trilogy of terror which is mm. very fondly remembered by Americans of a certain age as mm. being one of the scariest things they'd ever seen on telly. Um, so that was nice. I think it's, you know, her, her late career horror icon image was nice, but it wasn't the full spectrum of what she could do. And it it makes it kind of a surprise to see her in here as a very kind of girly girl, this, you know, mm. saloon bar. Uh, worker who's um, I think like about 90% of women in westerns she is only semi implicitly a sex worker yes when uh, Abe the Johnny Cash character says that you know sees her reading a book and he's like are you going to lounge around all day and she says something like well I don't start work until night which is great (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's another little bit a uh, great little bit where um i think johnny cash is like um and you you would think for like an age gunfighter to be starting drinking beer or something but they have this like little romantic moment together in like the hotel in uh, room mm. and it's just like why are you drinking milk and it's just like because i like <laughs> milk <laughs> um yeah and it's it, yeah and they definitely have nice chemistry as well like i completely agree so yeah um Good cast, good story, uh, and it's, you know, it, it can be a puzzle as to why it fell into obscurity. I think it has some flaws. I think Lawrence Rosenthal's score is nice, but it sounds like he hasn't actually seen the Western since 1945, and it's just mm-hmm. like going by memories of what kind of score they used to have back then. Yeah, it, it definitely does feel that, and you get that from the first number. Um, mm. Which is of, of course sung by Johnny Cash, but um, of course. and it's it, it's nice enough. But I, I wouldn't call it like my, I guess my favorite of his like like ballads. It's not essential, Cash, is it? It's, no, it's, it's not nice no. enough to hear, but but it's not his best. Mm. I would say. Um, but no, I, I completely agree with you on the score because he, he would at least expect from like say like the pivotal climax of this, and it, it's kind of anticlimactic a little bit as well. Um, how this film ends, mm. but um because you immediately think it's going to be like the Sergio Leone kind of style showdown where um it's nothing like like this cl- the, cl- the famous climax in the good the bad and the ugly where <laughs> they have like yes. obviously you have Lee Van Cleef, Eli Wallach and Clint Eastwood stood around in a triangle staring at each other while the camera just intensifies close-ups constantly and of course it's all heightened by Ennio Morricone's score here it's just like there's not really much of a score Johnny Cash shoots uh Will Tenere collapses over right bye um, that's how it, it plays it's yeah it's it's one of those things where part of the trap of having such a great central premise is two old friends decide to have a gunfight to raise money is that as soon as you say that you can sort of picture how the film will end and i don't think the despite that late film twist into confusing psychedelia which i do think is pretty great it, it uh, is neat but it, it does stick out like a soft thumb let's completely. be honest yeah, yeah. but d- despite that i don't really think it has a clever enough twist to stop you looking at the final gunfight and saying yeah that's more or less what i expected mm. 
Yeah, because it, it, like I said, the previous uh, hour and twenty minutes, it, it's very straight, very yeah. um, you know, very relaxed. So it, it doesn't really warrant it at all. Um, I think. It, or, no. or if it was going to go for that, at least into play it a lot more into much early in the film. I, I suspect, but then again, you know, it's I guess it's the product of the times. It it does feel like a trad western, and then suddenly at the end, Cavan Black uh, passed around some of the acid he kept from the set of Easy Rider, and mm. yeah, we're we're just going to do something different now, aren't we? Yeah, one cast member that I think we should also bring up. Um, mm. This was also. Let me just look it up now. This was uh, Keith Carradine's second film as well. Yes. Did. Because the, the, the opening credits say introducing Keith Carradine, which, I mean, if you want to have it established that the film you're going to watch is quite old, introducing Keith Carradine is the sort of credit that gets that across, isn't it? Yeah, and I think he kind of does work. Uh, and I say kind of in broad strokes, because he, he, <laughs> he, he, he only turns up for one scene, unfortunately. But um, he is the young gunfighter who approaches both Will Tenere and Abe Cross, who are wanting... Um, I think it's like they're doing publicity uh, shoots with mm, photographers yeah. or something like that, and they have like a crowd behind them. But the young gunfighter approaches them thinking, right, if I can take at least one of them out, I could get the money for myself and, you know, yeah. right here right now in like a little showdown um and that's how he appears he he comes in like obviously you know gallivanting across saying like right i want some of the money and you know how t- <laughs> i'm gonna fight at least one of you and i think he injures like uh the the sheriff who says like this is illegal um yeah but no I, th- I thought it was a nice little touch i thought it was a nice little um cameo that he gets uh, again not really developed all that well he just appears but it's one of those things, isn't it, where a, a lot of that 70s, 60s, 70s generation of actors got their break in Westerns as the kind of the young punk who the hero had to uh, had to sort of defeat mm. to prove that they were tough. Not the final villain, just someone to throw on the bonfire as they go on the way, you know yeah. what I mean? And to kind of show, like, Abe Cross, who he's up against as well. Yeah. So it's got that angle going for it as well. So it's not entirely, like, undeveloped, I would say. No, not at all. I'm trying to think, what was the... Um... There was a John Wayne film very late on in his career. Um, I-, I thought it was The Shootist, but maybe it wasn't. Um, oh, of course, The Cowboys was the one that... Uh, that Carradine made his actual screen debut. Oh no, that was Robert Carradine. Too many Carradines. Robert Carradine, Keith Carradine, David Carradine, there is too many of them. And, and of course, John Carradine, their dad, who that year, the trivia fans, uh, in 1971 was in another Western. Uh, he was in Kane's Cutthroats, which is infamous as the only Western to make it onto the video nasties list. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah, the video was nasty. His list was full of shit. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> it was absolute. <laughs> and I mean, I mean that from the standpoint dark. from the from the Tory from the Thatcher government at the time. Not. <laughs> yeah. No, it was absolute sort of throw a dart at a list of movies. Shit, really, wasn't it? <laughs> Stupid man. Um, Right, okay. <laughs> I found it, 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 it was the Cowboys. It wasn't any of the Carradines. It was Bruce Dern. And there was a very oh. famous anecdote that Bruce Dern told where he shot John Wayne. I don't know if he's like the only person to shoot John Wayne on film. I don't know if he did it in like, there, there was some cheapy he might have made early on in his career when it happened. But certainly by the time John Wayne was an established star, uh, mm-hmm. he didn't get shot on screen. And uh, Wayne took Dern aside on set and said, uh, you know, they're going to hate you in the Midwest for doing this. And Dern said, yep, but they're going to love me in Barclay. <laughs> and that, that was very much like uh, that generation of actors had that as their first role. They were the sort of snotty young long hair who they either 
killed a good man or got killed by a good man. And that is very much what Keith Carradine is doing here. Yes, de- yeah, definitely. Uh, but it's a, it's a good little performance, at least, yeah. just to see him there. So it, it, he works completely fine. So it's it's kind of one of the strange things about Cash having quite a slim canon of acting roles is it's not just the fact that he's good in this, but there is a strong association between Johnny Cash and cinema. And part of it is because his songs are so great on soundtracks. I mean, is, do you have a favourite Johnny Cash needle drop in cinema? Ooh, um because I'm, I'm trying to think there was that there was the trail. No, I'll tell you what it is. It was in Logan. Actually, mm. the 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 last X Men movie that well, and there's been so many of them now that I can't comment. But it was the last of... worthwhile X Men movie. <laughs> yes, um, that one where um, and it's kind of playing into the themes of like the American recordings thing because he is like someone uh, dying at the end of his tether, mm. and obviously this was before you know Hugh Jackman was confirmed for Deadpool three, but. Um, it's that bit where um, obviously Wolverine dies. Spoilers if you haven't seen Logan, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Too late. Uh, uh, where Wolverine dies. And I think it's the man who comes around that plays over the soundtrack, over the closing credits. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah. Which is a really I... great. I, yeah. I, which I really think is a lovely bit, really. The Man Comes Around is is one of those songs that always works. I always think of it as the song that introduces Brad Pitt's character in Killing Them Softly. The oh. film. I, I was only just recently talking about this actually on the Velvet Underground episode because, of course, that so, that film also uses heroin by the Velvet Underground in the most intensely literal way it's possible to do so. But uh, the idea of introducing Pitt's character uh, as with this abs- mm. this really apocalyptic song, you know, this song that Johnny Cash wrote after reading the Book of Revelation. It's, it's one of the few quite lateral music cues in the film, and it works gorgeously, I think. Mm, yeah. Um, and like I said, there's many instances like that. I mean, I can't really think of any more off the top of my head. I mean, obviously, Falls in Prison's been used a lot from everything. Um, and of course, mm. he has that little cameo role in The Simpsons, doesn't he, where he voices the coyote. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Which is great! great. <laughs> yeah! That is that must be slightly before the American recordings period, right? Because that'll be early nineties, I would think, or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, let me just quickly Google it again because I can't remember when that uh, happened. Because it was definitely around about that period. Because this was like the golden era of The Simpsons. Yeah, here we are, the mysterious voyage of Homer, ninety-seven. So, oh right, it was okay. That, it was it was still that like, period though, where Cash was reading yeah. himself. For, I think like the second time in a row, well, not in a row, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, but no, oh, that's interesting. So that that'll be part of the uh, cash revival then. Hmm. Yeah, and it's a good episode. That I, I remember that it's episode. Great. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> I have a great fondness for Homer just yelling in your face, space coyote, in front of Marge, who has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. It feels like the one that Alejandro Hodorowski directed in a way. <laughs> <laughs> that one, because the visuals just go wild, and I, I loved it as a kid. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fun. And uh, of course, there is also the thing we mentioned, the, the Hurt video, which feels absolutely more like a piece of cinema than it does uh, mm. a standard music video. Because that was, I think, the first music video that I noticed that could you know music videos can be like artful as well and can be really yeah. inspired because i remember like i think it was like trent Reznor said that obviously he went back to listen to his version and i'm not the biggest nine inch nails fan i just it's not due to the fact that i've i just really haven't had the time to really properly discover them really mm. um but i remember like trent Reznor saying in an interview saying that look i wrote this song initially hurt as a young man who didn't want to die Mm. Uh, obviously who'd done like a lot of drugs and you know things like that who's like obviously obviously full of fully anorexic and just like really at the end of his tether tether but then yeah. when cash sung it it was like someone who was about to meet his end uh and it really was at that time it was a really painfully like sad music video that really did speak to me at the t- at that time it's hard yeah. not to get like chills down your spine when you watch that music video 
It is because by the time it came out, uh, it was before Cash's death, but Jim Carter had died mm. just before it, and there were, there were those gorgeous shots of her just looking at, down at him as he plays the guitar with so much love, and you immediately realise that this is about something more than selling a record. You know, this is definitely the whole of man's and life. And of course, you you know, you get all the like classic like montage sequences of the man in his life you know where he's mm. on tour on the road obviously seeing his old family house um yeah um and obviously the like the memorabilia of like i think there was like a museum in like i, I can't remember where but it, it's definitely discussed in his autobiography it's in national i believe yeah yeah uh that that museum at the time of recording was sadly no longer around so you see like a lot of his old memorabilia like posters and microphone stands and records just kind of like in like storage containers and like dusty and like full of cobwebs so it it, Mm. it definitely feel it definitely punches you in the stomach yeah and it, it sort of goes back to the other thing that we were talking about with the American recordings that you've heard, in that it dignifies and makes a sort of central spotlight out of his age. You know, hmm. there's no soft focus on it. There's no shadowy lighting to hide how old he is. It's, the lighting on Cash is incredibly harsh hmm. and deliberately so. It's meant to impress you with every single wrinkle on this man's face. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it would, it's just so effective. Um, mm. So, so effective. And like I said, just powerful. And, you know, you can't really take that away from it. I, th- I think it's an astonishing piece of work. Um, I've just looked great. it up. It was, dire- yeah. it was directed by Mark Romanek. Uh, Rom- Mark Romanek, yeah. Who, yeah. I mean, I think if you only watch films, you might come away with the impression that Mark Romanek is a good director, but if you watch his music videos, you are aware that he's a great director. You know, he he works with Johnny Cash. He did the video for Are You Gonna Go My Way by uh, Lenny Kravitz. Oh, yeah, he did, didn't he? Uh, yeah. Free Your Mind by On Vogue. Strange Currencies by R.E.M. Jump, they say, by David Bowie. The new uh, Bowie documentary, by the way, uh, Moon Age Daydream, contains tons of behind the scenes stuff from the jump they say video and it's oh, it, romanic is thanked in the end credits for like loaning them this amazing treasure trove of footage of like boy on set preparing yeah. so i guess in a way kind of like jonathan glazer i guess yes because he's, yeah. he's got a very small filmography because the only thing that, that, that i mean the, the thing that stands out on his cv film wise is one hour photo which is the, one of robin williams's more serious performances obviously yeah um an incredibly dark film but Absolutely. um but when you look of the, at his work like outside of it much like jonathan glazier's that you know he's done like all sorts and you know it's a great little cv to have i think Every one of his videos is so inventive and he has that ability where he, he can do the most with the the least equipment, you know. And it, it feeds into the video for Hurt. Part of what's impressive in the video for Hurt isn't that it's a slick mega budget video, it's that it looks real. And similarly, hmm. when he did the video for El Scorcho by Weezer, he was already kind of getting bored of his reputation as doing really effects-intensive hmm. big shoots. So that whole video is just lit with table lamps, and it looks great. Hmm. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, you've got a great director. I mean, you've got Cash, like, obviously, at the on his last on his deathbed, pretty much. Hmm. I mean, we're not going to lie here. Yeah. Um, so it, it, all the pieces just naturally come together. So it's a natural fitting... Almost kind of a tribute to him as well, I think. You know, it when is, you think of it, yeah. yeah. It, it's very... strange. Uh, like a year or two after that, you got uh, Walk the Line, the biopic with Joaquin Phoenix, which I think is a good film. But in a strange way, you would see Johnny Cash's biopic before that. That the Hurt mm. video is a biopic in its mm-hmm. own way. Yeah, yeah, and I completely agree. I think Walk the Lines. A, a decent biopic but mm. again then again it's like um you're conventing it to like biopics of the noughties because they were everywhere 
I think that might have, yeah, that might have stopped me from appreciating it as fully as I did until a bit later, because part of me was thinking, oh, look, it's January, another one of these. <laughs> another film that wasn't porked at in uh, Walk Hard, the Jimmy Cox story. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's only one sort of dangling thread uh, that I feel... We sh- we haven't talked about it. It's right to bring it in here because I think it bookends the whole podcast. Mm-hmm. That opening credit, the Jicarilla Apache tribe of American Indians presents. <laughs> How did you feel when that came up? Uh, only. <laughs> I guess <laughs> what. Mm. I guess only a 70s Western in that period would come up with a title like that. Because could you imagine if that was slapped on like a Sergio Leone Western? No, not at all. It, it can't exist anywhere else other than this. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, when it comes up, part of you thinks, ah, right, it's going to be a sort of Dances with Wolves kind of Western, isn't it? It's mm. going to be, you know, maybe have more of a native perspective in it. But it doesn't. There isn't a single native character in the whole film. So the question... Nope has to be raised, why did the Jicarilla Apache tribe of American Indians have uh, decide to produce this film? And the answer is a very simple one. Go on. Their chief was a big Johnny Cash fan. Well, that makes sense. (laughs) Makes sense because everyone is a Johnny Cash fan. It's exactly what I've been saying. And if you you aren't, you shall be lynched. Um, (laughs) No. (laughs) Yeah, like yeah. Um, I just find it hard not to love the dude. Um, yeah. like I say, he was like, because there's like a misconception of Johnny Cash that people think of him as like, I guess not necessarily a hellraiser, but more like a bad ass kind of person who had troubles with the law, and he did have trouble and troubles with the law. But at the same time, you know, he he seemed like a very real, lovely person. Yeah, completely. You know? one of those rare guys where the road of excess probably did lead to the palace of wisdom rather than one of the more common guys who use that as an excuse Mm, definitely so yes listeners if you enjoyed this podcast you can get more of uh, our waffling by going to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show, where among many other goodies, you'll get a monthly bonus episode of this show that isn't available anywhere else, uh, as well as my Doctor Who reviews, Rob's Asian Cinema reviews, and any other bits and pieces that we think are worth putting out. But until then, I've been Graham. I've been Aidan. And we'll see you next week. 